Hey, good morning and welcome to our service here at Mission City. So glad that you're joining us online this morning. Uh, we were looking forward to being together outside again today as we have been the past several weeks, but uh, clearly God has a different plan for our time together today and we are trusting that his plan is always good and that he has uh, something in store for us today. So we receive what God has given to us today with thanksgiving. Hey, we would love it if you would take just a moment and fill out the connection card on our website to let us know that you've joined us online today. Uh, you can find that, of course, on our website. And while you're there, you can also fill in the prayer request form. Uh, if we can pray with you in any way about what God is uh, doing in your life right now or in the life of your family, we would love the opportunity to pray with you. You can fill in that prayer request form. And when you do, that goes to our staff, our elders, and our prayer team. And we pray through every one of those requests and we love to do that. So uh, let us know how we can be praying for you. And then when God answers your prayer as well, let us know that so we can praise God with you uh, together. Also on our website, you'll find our song lyrics and sermon notes for our time together today. And I'd encourage you to, to make sure you have that. You're going to need that in just a few minutes. Next Sunday morning, uh, we are planning to baptize some followers of Jesus here within our church. Next Sunday, July the 18th. And uh, I would encourage you with as much love and grace as I can right now that if you are a follower of Jesus and you have not yet been baptized, uh, we would love to talk to you more about what it means to uh, do that step of obedience to Christ and identify with him through his death, burial, and resurrection for you. And so we would love it if you would connect with us at some point here in the next day or two and let's get that conversation started so that you can be part of our baptism service next Sunday morning July 18th. Also, our Vacation Bible School is coming up this coming weekend, Friday and Saturday. Lord willing and weather permitting, it will all be outside. And we are looking forward to what the Lord will do there. Pray for the leaders, pray for the teachers, pray for the kids. Pray for God to break through in, in kids' lives and in families' lives as well. Uh, we have a few spots that are still open for Vacation Bible School. And registration will remain open until Thursday, July 15th. And uh, registration is necessary if you want your kids to be part of our Vacation Bible School this summer. For that and so much more, uh, any information that you need or details that you need, you can visit our website at missioncitybiblechurch.ca. You can also sign up for our e-news and follow us on social media as well. Well, our call to worship this morning comes from 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verses 8 through 10. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Let's lift up our voices to our God and King and worship him and give him the glory that he alone deserves. From the rising of the sun to the ending of the day one name alone be praised every nation tribe and tongue all creation lifting up your name alone be raised
present yourself to us. Maybe you're in the quiet of your living room, or maybe there's a bustle, a hustle of children around you. Maybe there's noise. And, but in this moment, in this moment, we just we give God thanks for these things. That He can still our hearts. Lord, so we just focus on you right now. We focus on you. We turn our attention to you, God. Receive our praise. Receive this offering of worship. Lord, continue to work in us as we approach you, Jesus. For you are worthy. Only you are worthy. Thank you, Jesus. song you ever sing worthy of all the praises you ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one we could ever see. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. song we could ever sing, worthy of all the praise we could ever bring, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, Lord. Jesus, the name above every other name. Yeah. 
ourselves up to be led by you in prayer. Father, would you speak to us now through your word, through the scripture, through the preaching today. Father, now open our, our, our ears, our minds, our hearts to receive who you are and all you've prepared for us in your word. God, we are here to meet with you, to be transformed by your love. So Lord, we are expectant. Open your Bible with me, please, to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation 21. We have been in this series, uh, Lord Help Me, for the past uh, several weeks now, learning again how to pray these short, simple prayers for when we find ourselves in difficult situations in our lives and, and situations that have a way sometimes of uh, bringing these surface emotions up to, up to the surface, things like anger and fear and worry or anxiety or, or lack of contentment or whatever it may be, and situations that in one way or another expose a heart of unbelief within us, and praying these short, simple prayers from our heart to say, Lord, help me. Lord, help me walk in faith. Help me walk in joy, in peace, in contentment, in love. And the title of today's message as we wrap up this series, uh, the final message in this series today, Lord, help me walk in hope. Lord, help me walk in hope. When we started this series several weeks ago, I showed you a diagram called the staircase of the heart. And when it comes to our walk with the Lord, we all have a choice to make as to which direction we're going to walk on that staircase. Uh, we most often get ourselves into difficult spots when we choose to walk down that staircase toward despair. And our descent down that staircase begins every time in the same place of unbelief. For any number of reasons, we don't believe that God is enough to handle the circumstance that we're going through and that unbelief exposes in us a heart of pride. In other words, when we're in a tough spot and we don't know how to get out of it and we want to fix it ourselves, and, and when that train inevitably rumbles off the tracks, and it always does, it, uh, it leads us to these bad places where these emotions, again, rise to the surface, things like anger and fear and worry and anxiety and so forth. But the good news of God's word, I want you to hear this today, the good news of God's word is that there is a way for us to walk back up a better staircase. And this whole series has been addressing not just these outward emotions that we see, but instead has focused on the condition of our hearts because Jesus has taught us over and over again that it's the condition of our hearts that ultimately drives the way that we behave. And so if we can remember that we have a hope in our heart that is greater than anything else in this life, then that begins to change the way that we see so many of the things that we go through in this life as well. But here's one of our biggest challenges. One of our biggest challenges is that this world has been trying to sell you a false hope. Think about it, we're tempted at so many turns to put our hope in so many different things. To put our hope in possessions, to put our hope in relationships or in our families or, or in our job or our reputation, uh, to put our hope in our accomplishments, in a bigger bank account. The list goes on and on and on. And, and from the day that we're born until the day that we die, the world will try to persuade us with this false hope, which is why we need to hear again what the Bible says about real hope. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 8, verses 24 and 25. For in this hope, we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. The Apostle Peter says in 1 Peter 1 verse 13, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Right before that in 1 Peter 1, verses 3 and 4, Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. See, Scripture points us often 
to a greater hope than anything that this life could give us. And this morning, I'm going to try my very best to point you to this great hope, to point you to this eternal hope that transcends anything and everything that we go through in this life so that when life gets hard, when you find yourself in those desperate moments and you can feel the anger or the anxiety or the worry or the fear welling up inside of you, you think about this eternal hope that transcends anything that we know in this life and it begins to change the way that we see so much of what we go through. So have your Bible open to Revelation chapter 21 and let's see just a little bit of this hope together this morning. Revelation 21 starting at verse 1 and down through to the first part of verse 5. Starting at verse 1, this is the word of the Lord. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Let's pray. So, Father, uh, we come into your presence right now, and again, uh, in this time of worship, in this time with your word open before us, asking, Spirit of God, that you would speak to us, that you would teach us again what true hope is, that we would look beyond this life, we would look beyond better circumstances, that we would look to the source of eternal hope, the only source of true and lasting hope. Lord, that you would help us in this moment to fix our gaze upon Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who has saved us into this living hope. So God, teach us now, I pray. Help us to take the circumstances that we're going through and filter all of it through the grid of true biblical hope. And Father, as we wrap up this series uh, today, I pray that you would do work within us that, that only you can do. Lord, whatever it is that you desire, whatever it is that you have purposed, even on this day today, As we consider and reflect on on what you have taught us through the course of this series, Lord, bring it all together in a way that is meaningful for each person that you're teaching and and based on what you alone know that we need in our hearts through this time, Lord, I pray transform your people, transform this church, Lord, bring us closer to you, give us a greater vision for your glory and for your majesty and who you are and what you can do and what you have done, and Lord, that it would fill our hearts with worship. That we would be captivated, captured again, I pray, by the glory and the wonder of who you are. So teach us now, I pray. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. That all the glory would be given to you, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the book of Revelation is a series of visions uh, given to the Apostle John. And he's the same John who wrote the Gospel of John. Same John who wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John just a little bit before the book of Revelation, and John is about 60 years removed now from having seen the crucified and risen Jesus, and Jesus is now showing John what must take place at the very end when this supernatural battle between good and evil finally comes to an end, and Jesus reigns supreme. That's why the book is called the Revelation of Jesus Christ. Notice, it's not the Revelation of John, it is the Revelation of Jesus to John. Revelation 21, you can see, is the second last chapter in all of the Bible. Uh, Chapters 21 and 22, you could make a very good case that God has saved the very best to the very last. This description of heaven that we are about to look at, just in these few verses I read, this is not even beginning to scratch the surface of what heaven will be like. It's almost like we're standing on the shore and we're about to dive into this ocean of, are you kidding me? This is so amazing. Like that's what this is, this description of heaven. And so what I want you to see here this morning is this. Heaven is our home and God is our reward and that's why you can walk in hope today. Heaven is our home and God is our reward 
And that's why you can walk in hope today. So I want you to see four reasons here. Four reasons that no matter what you're going through right now, no matter how hard it may seem or heavy it may feel, no matter what the situation is, four reasons that we can walk in hope. Here's the first. You can jot this down if you're taking notes. We can walk in hope because when we get to the new heaven and the new earth, we will finally be in the place that God has prepared for us. We will finally be in the place that God has prepared for us. You know, it brings to mind uh, what Jesus said in John chapter 14, a verse that you might be very familiar with. Uh, Many of us are. John 14 verse 2, Jesus said, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Now, it's important for us to understand that the promise from Jesus in John 14 is fully and finally being realized in all of its glory here in Revelation 21. All right, this new heaven and new earth is the place that Jesus has prepared for us and it is finally unveiled in all of its glory as our eternal home. Now, there's a couple of things that I want you to see here, I pray, as a way to bolster your hope in God. That as you consider what you're going through in your life right now, as you consider your circumstances, and again, how difficult it might be, I pray that as you consider these things, that it would be an encouragement to you, that it would encourage you to put your hope in God. First of all, notice this. John says in verse 1 that the first heaven and the first earth, so we're on the first earth right now. John says the first heaven and the first earth will pass away and the sea will be no more. Now the sea often represented a place of danger, a place of chaos, a place of separation. Uh, It was the water that separated people on one piece of land from people on another piece of land. And, And that danger and that chaos and the separation, those threats no longer exist in the new heaven and the new earth. That's why he says the sea is no more. And this has been God's plan A from the very beginning. You know, God didn't all of a sudden whip together a plan B when sin entered the world. This has been his original plan from the very start. Isaiah 65, verse 17. God says, for behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. 2 Peter 3, Peter talks about a time still to come when the heavens will pass away and the earth and its works will be exposed. And then Peter says this in 2 Peter 3, starting in verse 11. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? Waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn, But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. See, Peter says here that because you know that day is coming, because you know that Jesus has gone and prepared this place for you, that ought to impact the way that you live your life right now. He's saying that the reality of this new day ought to grip our hearts so deeply that we realize the urgency of living a life of godliness and holiness right now. See, this life is not all about what you can pile up for yourself. This life is not all about what you can do for yourself. Peter is essentially bottom lining the entire issue for us and asking, listen, what day are you living for? What life are you living for? And he says, you can know that you're living for the life to come when your life now is marked by a purposeful pursuit of godliness and holiness. Listen, what life are you living for? Are you living for this life and everything that this life can give you? Are you pouring all of your time and your energy, your talents, your treasures, all of your resources into this life, hoping that you can squeeze as much out of this life as you possibly can because this life is the most important thing to you? Is that your priority? Or are you living this life for the life that is still to come, for this place that Jesus has gone to prepare for us? Which life are you ultimately living for? And again, Peter says the way that you can know that you're living for the life to come is that you are living this life with an urgency for godliness and holiness in what you do. Because that means then that you're doing all that you can 
by the grace of God and out of the love of Jesus to be ready for that day when we will finally be in our eternal home with him. See, that's the question of the day, loved ones. Which life are you living for? Here's the second thing I want you to see. Verse 2, the holy city, the new Jerusalem, comes down out of heaven from God like a bride walking down the aisle toward her husband, only infinitely better. This is perhaps the, the most um, impactful illustration that John could give of this. And, and just try and picture what he's saying here in verse 2, this new city coming down out of heaven from God. We have no concept of this at all. And yet part of what John is telling us is that there is coming a time when God, in all of his glory and in all of his power, will bring heaven and earth into the same dimension. Now just try and wrap your mind around that. And notice, he says here that this is coming from God. God is literally bringing heaven to earth. And there will no longer be any separation between the two. Commentator Anthony Hokema writes this. He says, in his redemptive activity, God does not destroy the works of his hands, but cleanses them from sin and perfects them so that they may finally reach the goal for which he created them. Applied to the problem at hand, this principle means that the new earth to which we look forward will not be totally different from the present one, but will be a renewal and glorification of the earth on which we now live. Again, just try and wrap your head around that. Heaven coming down to earth. Just think of the hope that is wrapped up in this, loved ones. No more sin. No more suffering. No more separation. We'll talk about those things more in just a few minutes, but, but just consider this. None of that remains because this will be the place where righteousness lives in total perfection. The call of Jesus for us is simply this. Are you ready for that day? Are you ready for that? Are you living for that day? Are you separating yourself from sin? Are you setting yourself apart to God? See, Jesus has prepared this place for us. Are we ready to receive it? Another commentator said it so well, said it better than I ever could. He's talking about the new heaven and the new earth, and he says uh, that this is an earth which no longer smarts and smokes under the curse of sin, an earth which needs no more to be torn with hooks and irons to make it yield its fruits, an earth where thorns and thistles no longer infest the ground, nor serpents hiss among the flowers, nor savage beasts lay in ambush to devour, an earth whose sod is never cut with graves, whose soil is never moistened with tears or saturated with human blood, whose fields are never blasted with unpropitious seasons, whose atmosphere never gives wings to the seeds of plague and death, whose ways are never lined with funeral processions or blocked up with armed men on their way to war. But then listen to this. An earth whose hills ever flow with salvation and whose valleys know only the sweetness of Jehovah's smiles. An earth from end to end and from center to utmost verge, clothed with the eternal blessedness of paradise restored. Awesome. Loved ones, don't miss this. We can walk in hope because we will finally be in that place that God has prepared for us. Here's the second reason we can walk in hope. Number two, because when we get to the new heaven and the new earth, we will finally be with God. We will finally be with God. Now, uh, just to be clear, this does not mean that we will not be with God before this new heaven and earth. Of course we will. The Bible tells us that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We will be with him, but I think part of what John is saying here is that even our relationship with God will enter into a new dimension when we experience the new heaven and the new earth. John says in verse 3, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place, literally the tabernacle, the temple of God, is with man. 
He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. See, this is the ultimate fulfillment of God's promise to be with his people. This is God with us. I mean, think about this at Christmas time. We celebrate the incarnation, which is God with us. And, and the incarnation is about God inhabiting space and time in the person of Jesus. And what makes all of that so remarkable is that God has eternally existed. He is the uncreated creator. He has existed before space and time. And yet because of his love for us, because of his grace and mercy toward us, he comes into space and time to be with us. And then we know that the incarnation led to the crucifixion, and the crucifixion led to the resurrection, and the resurrection then led to the ascension, to that moment where Jesus was taken up into heaven, where he now sits at the right hand of the Father. And, and God inhabiting space and time in the incarnation was a temporary thing. But the recreation, what's happening here in Revelation 21, the recreation is about God making his eternal home to be with us. In his book about heaven, Randy Alcorn has a way of describing this. He says, uh, instead of us going up to be with God, because we have this concept in our mind that heaven is up, right? So when we die, we go up into heaven, we think. And, and he says, instead of us going up to live with God forever, it's like God will come down to live with us forever. Man, if you're anything like me at this point, you're asking yourself, well, how can that be? I mean, he's God, we're human, how does any of that work? Like, is that even possible? Don't forget that, that John has just told us that the first heaven and the first earth have passed away, and a new heaven and a new earth are here, and God is now ushering in this new holy city. And in this new holy city, the new Jerusalem, listen, everything that has separated heaven and earth will be demolished because heaven has come to earth. Now think of what that's going to mean. It's going to mean that we're no longer going to struggle with having to choose between living for God or living for self. It means we're no longer going to have to choose between sin and holiness. All of our attention will always and only be given to God. Because God has come to live with us and God himself will be with us as our God and nothing will change that for all of eternity. Man, I just pray and hope right now that this fills our hearts with worship and adoration and a longing for that day. Like, like think about it, when you think about that day when the new heaven and the new earth come, when you think even just for a little bit about what that day is going to be like and you contemplate what it's going to be like to finally be with God forever, you have to eventually come to the place where you admit that there is nothing in this life that compares to that when we will literally experience heaven on earth. And, and the thing is, we go through this life and we try and compare so many things to that. We try and hold up our jobs or, or a family or our relationships or our accomplishments. We try and hold those things up and make those things the ultimate in our lives. But eventually, if you are thinking biblically about heaven, about the new heaven and the new earth, when you think about it, even just for a moment, you have to admit that there is nothing in this life that even holds a candle to the reality of what the new heaven and the new earth will be like and for us to be in the presence of God forever. Like, seriously, there are times in our worship gatherings here where, where we're singing and it's a little bit different when we've been outside because outside the sound just travels, there's nothing to hold it in. But when we're here in this room and we've got four walls around us and we start singing and it gets louder and louder and more glorious, like there are times, honestly, where I just stop and I just listen. I just listen to you because it encourages me so much. And, and just as I'm listening, it's filling my own heart with more and more worship. And, and there are times where we've done that and, and you kind of think to yourself, you know, it's almost like a little taste of heaven on earth. I mean, there have, there have even been times where I've said that, that it's just kind of like a little slice of heaven. You know, and, and we know what we mean when we say those things. But let's be honest, there is nothing that comes even close to what it's going to be like for us to finally be with God and be in his presence forever. And where we literally know what it feels like to experience heaven on earth. Because that's going to be, that's what it's going to be all the time. 
and it's never going to get old, and it's never going to fade away, it's never going to wear out, we're never going to long for something new or something fresh. You know, our staff uh, makes fun of me pretty regularly, and with good reason, uh, because I like to rearrange m- the furniture in my office, like on a pretty regular basis, because I just kind of get bored with it, and I want something new, I want something fresh, and so I've made it my personal mission to find as many different ways to rearrange the furniture in my office as I possibly can without duplicating it once, and so they make fun of me, again, with very good reason, because I want something new, I want something fresh, but listen, when we get to heaven, that will never be the case, because we will be with God, and God will be with with us and it will be for all of eternity and it will fulfill the greatest longings and desires of our hearts forever. And so loved ones, let's use the time that we have together here, that we have together right now here on this earth, living and longing for that day still to come. Let's use our worship now to tune us up for a time unlike anything that we have ever known before when we finally stand in his presence, in his glory for all of eternity and give him the worship and the praise and the honor and the glory that he alone deserves for all time. That leads us then into the third reason that we can walk in hope. Number three, again, you can jot this down. Because when we get to heaven, when we get to the new heaven and the new earth, sin and all of its consequences will finally be gone forever. Sin and all of its consequences will finally be gone forever. Verse 4, one of my favorites in all the Bible. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. It would seem here that these are the tears caused by sin and sorrow. And in one glorious cosmic reset, God completely reverses the curse of sin. Isaiah 25 verse 8, He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all their faces. And the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. Isaiah 35, verse 10. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Revelation 20, verse 14. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. Just think, all the pain, all the suffering caused by the curse, completely destroyed forever. And think about what that means for the life that we live right now. No more self-pity when we get to heaven. No more despair. No more anger or fear or lust. No more desires, overwhelming desires for recognition or respect or approval. No more pride or unbelief. No more divorce or betrayal. No more miscarriages or prodigal children or prodigal spouses or broken families. No more temptation. Can I get a witness? Amen. No more embarrassment or shame or guilt or tragedy or pain or suffering or persecution anymore. No more jealousy. No more insecurity, greed, envy, frustration or failure. No more anxiety. No more worry. No more sadness or loneliness. No more wondering if you measure up. No more funerals in heaven. No more graveside services or hospital visits, or doctor's appointments, or cancer treatments. No more disabilities. No more racial injustice, or social chaos. No more oppression. No more cries of the poor, or the widowed, or the unborn. Listen, only a perfect, loving, and joy-filled experience in the presence of our Lord forever. Why? Because sin and all of its consequences 
are finally gone forever. One last point, number four. We can walk in hope because when we get to the new heaven and the new earth, God will finally redeem everything. God will finally redeem everything. See this, friends, right here. This is the climax of the entire redemptive story. Okay, The climax of redemption is, is not the rapture of the church. It's not the return of Christ. It's not his millennial reign. As much as we look forward to those things and as, as amazing as those things will be, the climax of the redemptive story is right here. God is redeeming all things and he is making all things into what he originally intended for them to be. Verse 5, and he who is seated on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. Notice here that God is making all things new. Not he has made all things new, not he will make all things new. Instead, it's behold, I am making all things new. And this is happening now after he has created the new heavens and the new earth. It's amazing, isn't it? Like just try and again wrap your mind around that, that the Bible is bookended by the creative activity of our God. From the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation, our creator will never stop creating because his creativity will never be exhausted. And as he creates, all of the impacts of sin are forever washed away. All of creation is made new. We are made new. And all the wrongs are made right. And every longing is forever satisfied in him. In his fiction book called Safely Home, Randy Alcorn imagines what it would be like when one of his characters in the book finally gets to heaven. The character has a conversation with the king and he says, I feel like I'm drinking from the source of the stream. Does this mean I'll feel no more longing? And the king, who is the source of the stream, responds by saying, you will have the sweet longing of desire that can be fulfilled and shall be fulfilled again and again and again. In other words, in heaven, you'll still have the desire, but the desire will be fulfilled perfectly every single time in God himself. And then he says this, heaven is not the absence of longing, but it's fulfillment. Heaven is the fulfillment of every longing, every desire of our heart, of our soul. Because we're in the presence of God. Loved ones, this is our hope. When life gets hard, when life feels overwhelming, when desperate times call for simple prayers, when we struggle to find fulfillment for any and all of life's desires, listen, loved ones, listen, look ahead. Look ahead to that day. Look ahead to that day when all things will be made new, when we are in the presence of God forever in the new heavens and the new earth, and every desire is perfectly and forever fulfilled in the presence of your ever-creating and always redeeming God. He alone is our hope. He alone is our satisfaction. Heaven is our home, and God is our reward. And that's why we can walk in hope today. Let's pray. So Father, I, I ask right now, just in the, the quietness of this time of reflection and consideration, Lord, as we come to the end of this series, with all that we have talked about, with everything that we have covered, God, I pray that you would sanctify us through and through. I pray that you would cause the truth of your word to go deep into the recesses of our hearts. That it would truly change then the way that we live. Lord, that we would see you perhaps in new ways. We would see you, I pray, in anxiety-crushing ways. In fear-displacing ways. Lord, that all of our worry, and all of our discontent, all of the anger, the pride, the unbelief, the despair, the hopelessness, whatever it is, Lord, that 
that your people struggle with, that we struggle with, that I struggle with, Lord, would be laid down at the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, who has defeated all of these things forever. So God, I pray, would you pour out grace upon your people even right now in this moment to to take the circumstances that are causing us some of these outward emotions, the fear, the anxiety, the worry, whatever it is, Lord, that you would give us the grace to consider why we're feeling those things, to search deep within our heart, to see, see where we've gone wrong, what we are not believing and what we need to believe regarding the truth of who you are and what you have said, that it would then change us, that you would help us to walk in faith, that you would help us, Lord, I pray, to walk in the fear of the Lord, that you would help us to walk in humility, that you would help us to walk in peace, in love, in joy, that you would help us to walk in gratitude. Lord, help us walk in hope. We look forward to that great day when you will come again. You will make all things new. We love you. We thank you for your grace and your love toward us. We pray these things in Jesus' name.
church, having met with the Lord today, may we be transformed and sent out in his power to give the world a glimpse of the new heaven and the new earth. Go in peace. You are loved.